Well, brothers and sisters, you may not be aware of this, but today is the 12th day of Epiphany. And Epiphany is the season in which we highlight it traditionally in the church calendar. We highlight the revealing of Jesus, the Messiah, to the Gentile nations. In other words, we highlight how we uh, come to know Jesus. And this is, this is started off by the visit of uh, the Magi to Jesus, um, and, uh, and it's followed up by uh, Jesus being revealed to us, obviously. But today, we are understanding, we are learning about how not only is Jesus revealed to us, but we are revealed to Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus has known us since before the foundation of the world. Before the world was even created, he knew who we are because he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, great triune God that is from everlasting to everlasting. It is important for us to remember and not take for granted that reality, not to just gloss over it. There are at least two aspects in which God knowing us is really, really significant for us. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first, we want to talk about the, we want to read the scripture passages for today. And so our first scripture passage, if you want, you can turn with me to Psalm 139, Psalm 139, and uh, we will read verses 1 to 6 there, and then we will also read as well verses 13 to 18. Now that is not to say that the rest of the psalm is not worth reading, not at all but rather to just say that these passages, these verses within the psalm, really emphasize how God knows us. So, if you will turn with me to Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6, we will start there. You have searched me, says David. This is a psalm of David, by the way. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my lips, you, Lord, know it completely. You Hem me in before and behind, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. You created me, David goes on in verse 13. You created me, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you in the depths of the, in the secret place. Excuse me. Let me try that again. Verse 15. My frame was not hidden from from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Then when I awake, I am still with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
This, this passage is so amazing. It is, it is David vulnerably recognizing that, that God knows him inside and out. In the rest of the psalm, we hear about how David recognizes that there is nowhere that he can go to escape God's scrutiny. And that is true, for sure. In this passage, we see that God's knowledge of us is inescapable and infinite in detail. God knows everything there is to know about us. He knows us more than we know ourselves. And that's an intimidating thought for David. That's why he says in the, in the verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And then he goes on in verse 7 to say, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? It's pretty intimidating. All of those secret corners that David may have been tempted to think he had are known to God. And that is true for us as well. There is no corner of our heart, mind, soul, or body that God does not know intimately and totally. We've touched on this before on numerous occasions. We have this tendency to think that in my head, the thoughts in my head are private to me. That it is my space up there. Hmm. That's just not true. It's funny, we have this obsession these days with privacy concerns. You know, people are careful, and, and, and rightly so. They try to be careful on the internet that they don't share all kinds of things that they don't really want shared with the whole world by accident. You have to watch your Facebook settings or watch your social media connections and watch your internet security and make sure that your passwords are all kept safe and good. And you have to make sure that you've got numerous different passwords. Oh, <laughs> one of the things that I often have to deal with, and, and uh, I'm sorry, father-in-law for, for doing this, but my father-in-law is often very challenged when it comes to remembering passwords and keeping track of them. I don't know how many times he has called to talk to me about how he can't find his password for this or that or the other thing. And truth be told, his experience is not really all that unusual, is it? We all have that problem from time to time. I, either that or we're using the same password for everything and our privacy is not secure at all. But privacy is not a real thing when it comes to God. There is no privacy, there is no password that you can use to encrypt the things in your head to keep them away from God. There is nothing, no key that you can put on your heart to prevent God from knowing about you. God made you. God knows you. God knit you together in the secret place. And if that is not intimidating to you on some level, then you're probably not thinking about it enough. There is no place within you or me that is hidden from God. 
Listen to the second passage for today, which comes from John chapter 1. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry as John records it, uh, or pretty close to the beginning. We're going to start in verse 43. Jesus is in the process of calling those who will become his disciples. And in this story, we hear about Jesus calling Philip and Nathaniel. So John chapter 1, verses 43 and following. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of of man. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I love this little story about the calling of Philip and Nathaniel. Uh, I mean, Philip, he, he sort of falls in a pattern with, uh, with Andrew, who comes before him, and with Peter, who comes uh, later as well. He, he, he gets called, and he just says, okay, yeah, right on, here I go, right? There's no, there's no, uh, there's no doubt about it. But Nathaniel, Nathaniel, he's so honest. He's so honest, right? He says, he says, when Philip says that Jesus is from Nazareth, Nazareth, he says, Nazareth, can anything good, can anyone good come from there? <coughs> Excuse me. Right? <laughs> Sometimes people maybe shouldn't be at least totally honest out loud. Well, no, they should be honest, but, well, my mother always said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, right? But Nathaniel, he doesn't realize fully who he's dealing with. He just says what he thinks, and, and probably he thinks that he's, you know, saying it in confidence to Philip. Hey, hey, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? But Jesus knows him. And Jesus calls him out on it, but not, not in a mean, judgy sort of way. I mean, he could get all offended and say, how dare you say that my hometown is is." a place that no one good can come out of. <laughs> but he doesn't. Instead, he almost praises Nathaniel and says, hey, look, this guy is honest, right? This guy is honest. There is no deceit in him. And Nathaniel acknowledges that. You notice, he doesn't try to pretend like he didn't say anything. He doesn't try to make excuses for what he said or anything like that. He just outright says, hey, how, how do you know me? 
Like that's, that's how honest Nathaniel is. <laughs> he just says, oh yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's, I'm that guy who just says stuff, right? And Jesus, Jesus, he knows Nathaniel. And he loves Nathaniel. He loves Nathaniel. He brings Nathaniel into the circle of his closest followers, those 12 disciples. Brothers and sisters, it is intimidating. To know that Jesus sees into our very hearts, minds, and souls every corner of every part of who we are. Our past, present, and future, everything. That's intimidating. But it's also beautiful. Because Jesus doesn't see all of that and reject us. Jesus doesn't see all of that in Nathaniel and say, hey, forget it, this guy is washed out. He's no good. He's not good enough to be part of my group of disciples. No, 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 no. He promises him greater things. He welcomes him into the group. And it's the same with us and with every person on this earth. Every person who has ever been or ever will be. Jesus sees us and loves us. Now, we can, we can reject that love. We can refuse that love. But the opportunity is there. See, there are two important st steps here, really. The first is that we need to recognize that God knows everything. That there is no hidden spot within us. That is so important. David recognized that in Psalm 139. And David recognized that on numerous occasions throughout his life. Right? Remember when he is confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. And he recognizes that, that really, truly, there is no hidden place within him from God. That God knows everything about him. And that causes him a lot of shame and guilt and repentance, which is good. That repentance is important. That shame and guilt that leads to repentance is also important. And this is why that first step of recognizing that there is nothing that God does not know about us is so critical. We need to realize that all of the filth in our lives is not hidden from God. And that it's not okay with God either. God is not okay with tolerating that filth and yuck forever. God is not okay with us being sinful forever. We should feel some shame and guilt that leads to repentance. But then the second stage is really important, too. We need to know that we need Jesus. We need to know that none of the sin is hidden from him. We need to know that we are filthy apart from him. And we need to know that God, though he sees those things, loves us 
anyway. This is the heart of the gospel message. That God, though he sees the sin, loves us anyway. That God, though he sees the darkness of our souls, sends his son Jesus to love Nathaniel, to love you, to love me, to love every person on this earth. To love us so much that he will do something about about it, that he will come and bring people like Nathaniel and you and I and everyone else who will receive him into his circle, and he will walk with them and talk with them and cleanse them ultimately of their sin through his sacrifice on the cross. Brothers and sisters, this is epiphany, the time where not only is, is Jesus revealed to the Gentiles, like we are talking about here, but also where we realize as part of that revelation that Jesus knows us, that we are revealed to him, and that is both a terrible and a beautiful thing. Brothers and sisters, let us, let us search our hearts. Let God search our hearts and know if there is any wicked way in us. And let God cleanse us. Let us not pretend that everything is all right in our hearts, that we are perfect, but rather let us submit truthfully and honestly in repentance to Jesus that he may cleanse us, that his love may overcome our shame, and that we may live as adopted sons and daughters of God. Amen. Amen.